Hello, welcome. This is Sam Hinden with Mount Underwood Baptist Church. Thank you for coming online today with us for our daily, weekly. We have a daily Bible reading program, but this is the weekly church service. Thank you for joining with us. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and sing a few songs, for then we'll get into God's message for the day. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be able to come before you and worship you and spend time with you and learn more about you. We just ask that you would meet with us and that you would help us with the things that need to be said. Help me to remember the things that you put in my heart. Pray that you would bring us all to a closer understanding of you, a closer understanding of your soon uh, trumpet call to call us home. I pray that you would convict us of our own personal sin and that you would convict us of your righteousness and our judgment to come. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you would keep away hindrances and distractions and uh, any demonic spirits that would try to hinder your work and hinder people from listening to your message today. We ask that you would bring online the people that you would like to uh, uh, hear this message and that it would be helpful for that you'd bring conviction to each and every heart so we can inspect ourselves and see the things that we need to change and give us the commitment and the willingness and the faith to uh, lean on you to make those changes. We thank you that there's nothing that we can do by ourselves, but nothing is impossible with you. We thank you that he that is great here in us is greater than he that is in the world. But Lord, we know that's you. And we give you all the thanks and praise. We do ask that you be with each and every preacher that's going to be preaching here this morning uh, throughout the nation, throughout the world. Be with them. I pray the ones that are preaching for your name's sake would be uh, uh, have your power and your strength and be able to uh, preach your message in the way that you need it preached so the people's lives can be changed. Help us, Lord, as we try to learn to humble ourselves and to seek your face and to draw close to you. We ask that you would bless us today. Thank you for each person out there, Lord. There's a lot of different problems, a lot of different needs, and, and each family has uh, situations they're dealing with, and the devil seeks to divide and conquer, but Lord, we pray that you would bring healing and that you would bring salvation into each family, then that uh, each person could uh, reach out to the souls that are around them. Lord, we don't want to miss one person that we're supposed to win for you, but we don't want to leave behind any of our family members. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Bring peace to Jerusalem and bless the Jews. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to start out with grace greater than our sin. We love this song. This is one that we are very familiar with. We sing it often at the nursing homes, or at least we did when we were able to go to the nursing homes. So please sing along with us and enjoy this song because God's grace is greater than our sin. Grace means undeserved favor. We did not deserve salvation. There's nothing good in us except for the Lord Jesus when we accept him. So sing this song with us, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is a stain that we cannot hide. 
What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Wider than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see His face. Will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Thank you, Lord. We're going to sing at Calvary. We're in the red back hymnal today. And uh, that's what we use each week. Page 166, if you have that there at your house. We're going to sing at Calvary. Here's a spent in vanity, vanity and pride. Carry not, my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it, it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. At Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend. At Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Amen, amen. We're going to read 334, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, all right. Page 334, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Is Jesus yours? He can be. Jesus he can be if he is not. And all you have to do is ask. Believe, confess your sins, and ask, and he will come into your heart. And he will save your soul and give you a home in heaven forever and ever. 
I love the Lord. Did you want to sing love Jesus his salvation. Loves me? We'll sing the B I B L E before we sing this one and Jesus loves me. We have uh, kids out there that love these songs and we'll sing along with them. So let's sing B I B L E. The B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E Bible. All right. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, loves me still. Though I'm very weak and ill. From his shining throne on high Comes to watch me where I lie Yes, Jesus loves me Yes, Jesus loves me Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so Amen, amen. And the Bible does tell us of the love of Jesus. And we do stand on the Bible and that alone. There is no other book that can tell you how to get to heaven with perfect accuracy, with no flaws, but the King James Bible. It is the Word of God. And it is given to the English-speaking people, but those around the world, to know how to come to Jesus, to know the how to come to the Lord. Let's sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of his spirit washing his blood this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long perfect submission perfect delight visions of rapture now burst on my side angels descending drink from above Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Crazy, my Savior, all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Crazy my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, 
this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. All right. We're going to sing a couple of verses of Standing on the Promises, the very next page, 335, because that goes along with our message today. We didn't plan on this, but uh, we will go ahead and sing it because uh, we're going to talk about some promises that God has given us for uh, uh, healing our land, the recipe for Christian growth and uh, getting in touch with God. So we'll see. Standing on the promises. Standing on the, the promises of Christ, Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. Bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen, amen. All right. Thank you, Erica. All right. Well, we will get started here today. Then before we get into the message, I need to turn down the volume. Before we get into the message, we're gonna fix the camera here, I guess. All right, there we go. Thank you. Uh, just uh, going over some headlines to recap what's going on in this world today. Uh, I'll read over a few of these, just a few. And there's all kinds of stuff happening all around us on a daily basis, showing us that we are getting closer and closer to the trumpet and the voice of the Lord, where he's going to open the door of heaven and call his children home. If you're not one of his children, you will be left here to go through terrible plagues that are coming upon the face of this earth. And uh, things are going to be disastrous and not many people will, will survive. 
Matter of fact, the Bible says it's going to be so bad that uh, if the Lord had not shortened the time period that he scheduled for this uh, time of the Great Tribulation, that no flesh would survive. But it's going to be that bad. So uh, we're going to read off some of the headlines of what's going on and what's pointing us in the direction of uh, understanding that we are very, very close to the rapture. Uh, DARPA, uh, the government foundation, has funded implantable biochips that will be available by 2021. That's out by the uh, Mint Press news.com uh, also uh, RT news put this out the other day 380 whales die in Australia 380 pilot whales die in Australia that is a huge family of animals uh, it, I, I saw pictures of it it was absolutely pitiful and sad to see those creatures there uh, uh, washed up on the beach shore dead and dying. They were able to save a few, but not many. Uh, let's see. Five of, the, uh, five of the six worst ever fires in California have uh, been burning this year. Every year it seems to get worse and worse. And this year we have five uh, out of the most dangerous and most uh, destructive wildfires happening this year. Five out of six. Let's see. Uh, there was an Arlington fourth grader who was sent home from school just because he sneezed. That's how paranoid and that's how much fear is uh, going on in this nation. The Bible told, tells us Christians we have not been given a spirit of fear but of power and of, of love and a sound mind. And uh, we can see through the things that uh, the rest of the world doesn't realize is ha happening. And for them to send a little uh, fourth, year, four, fourth grader home just because he sneezes is showing the extremes of fear that people are living in. Uh, the Bible says that in the last days before the rapture and even during the tribulation period, the men's hearts will be failing them for the fears of things coming upon this earth. But the Bible also tells us that violence is going to increase. And in Chicago, just over the weekend of September 19th through the 20th, that was last weekend, not this weekend, uh, there were 45 people shot, 10 people killed. Imagine that in one city, 45 people shot. Uh, for me, that sounds like a war zone, and yet it is happening week after week after week. Uh, in St. Louis, the homicide rate has reached historic levels. But that was put out by a uh, uh, sttodaynews.com. Seattle Today. Uh, I guess Seattle Today. Uh, dot com. But uh, yeah, the homicide rates have reached historic levels. Not only that, uh, I just read something the other day about suicide rates in America and around the world have gone up astronomically since uh, this COVID uh, disaster has been sweeping across the world. Then, let's see, Rochester, New York. Two teens uh, died, 14 were injured in a shooting. Uh, the, the news phrased it as a tragedy of epidemic proportion. Let's say 14 people being murdered is uh, pretty uh, uh, epic for sure. Uh, the Department of De 
Department of Justice, the DOJ, has just designated New York City as an Antarctic and anarchist jurisdiction due to the permitted violence and destruction of property and the refusal of the city to take responsible measures to counteract the criminal activity. So the Department of Justice has uh, announced that if you're living in New York City, you need to be aware that they are considering it an anarchist jurisdiction. So it's it's getting out of control up there. Let's see. Uh, 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 the Bible says that there'll be a great falling away in the last days. And uh, people that have believed the truth will be turning from it. They'll seek to themselves teachers having itching ears. And there's one story here from the DailyMail.com where uh, a church called Woke Advert, uh, I guess that's a new uh, thing, people say uh, they're woke, but a Woke Advert church set, uh, featured a billboard and a sign with a bearded Jesus with women's breast and makeup on. That's a mockery of Christ. And uh, uh, that's a, a transgender uh, spirit that is sweeping our nation and our world. And uh, that's the devil wanting to pervert the things of God, pervert what's right and call it wrong. And this is a church that has taken on that as their identity and their uh, platform. China has just banned teachers from mentioning God or prayer and it's intensifying its crackdown on Christians and it's also seeking to rewrite the Bible. I don't know what they plan on, re how they plan on rewriting it, but it'll certainly uh, put it on their government's favor, I'm sure. But a little good news out there. Ohio, the Ohio governor has just signed a bill banning officials from closing houses of worship. Now that is very good because that goes right along with the First Amendment and uh, we as Americans have that right to worship and meet in uh, our, our uh, locations wherever that may be to be able to glorify God and honor him without government restrictions no matter whether whether it's a pandemic or uh, uh, a war or a riot or anything else we have the right to gather and worship the Lord together as Christian people also, another good news, uh, American Sign Language Bible has finally been completed after 39 years. That's good news for people that are hard of hearing or cannot hear at all. Uh, now they have a uh, Bible that is completed with sign language. The Bible tells us Christians to seek the Lord while he is near. And that's what we need to be doing. And that's what our message is going to be about today. Is drawing near to the Lord. Let me stretch here for a second. I'm going to move this paper here off the podium so we can get to the message. And we'll get into that. If you will, turn to Romans 1. Romans 1, this is still our text verse for this uh, series that we're in. And thank you for everyone that's joining us out there online. Please uh, feel free to invite your family and friends and uh, loved ones and those that you think that uh, could benefit from these messages. But the title of our message is, Do You Really Believe There Is a Hell? Because if we believe there is a hell, then we know there is a hell, it will alter the way we live. 
And the portion of the message we're going to speak on today is humbling ourselves. Do you really believe there's a hell? If you do, you will humble yourself. Then we'll get into that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll be in Romans 1, 1 through 8. Dear Lord, we pray that you would open up to receive your message. Keep away distractions that help people that, to, that you want to hear this message, to, to listen attentively and to apply it to their hearts and minds, to their lives, and let it change them for eternal glory. We thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Paul told us here in Romans, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God, which he had, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So Paul was telling them, I'm preaching the same gospel. I was called to the same gospel that was talked about way back in the Old Testament. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, when declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So we are, they were called to obedience to the faith among all nations. And then he goes on and says, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ to all be, that be at Rome, he is talking to the Christians there, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now that's the only way we can come to God is through Jesus Christ. When he was thanking the Lord through Jesus Christ that these Christians faith was spoken of throughout all all their known world at that time can God say that about you that's the question from week to week in this this series can God say that can people say that about you that your faith is spoken of everywhere that you go Matthew 5 13 tells us that we're the salt of the earth but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot. Our faith, our walk with the Lord, is supposed to bring people closer to Him. It's supposed to be like that seasoning that we love to put on our food that enhances the flavor and makes it delicious. We're supposed to make God look good we're not supposed to look like the world or act like the world or be like the world or be drawn to the world. We're supposed to preserve the Christian faith. We're supposed to preserve the things of God. We're supposed to be a preserver for this world. Salt enhances flavor. It is a preservative. It sanitizes and heals. Salt slows down the decaying process. When the salt is removed, all chaos will take place. Uh, when we Christians are removed, all chaos is going to take place. Things are getting, uh, things are bad, and we see that all over the country and all over the world. We see riots breaking out and disasters happening, but this is just a prelude of the, the actual time of Jacob's trouble as God puts it in his word which is coming very very soon now in Romans 1 14 through 15 the Bible tells us I am a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarians both to the wise and to the unwise then he said so much as is in me 
so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. The Bible says to be instant in season and out of season. We as Christians should not only have our faith spoken of throughout the whole world, but be salt that draws people to Christ, adds flavor to the things of Christ, makes it appealing to people, but we should also be ready to preach the gospel. We, each one of us that know the Lord as our Savior should be willing, able, and ready to share the gospel at a moment's notice when the door is open. But Paul said to pray that a do open door would be, our door would be open for him to present the gospel. But each one of us should be praying the same thing for our lives. Now, our text verse today also is found in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 through 15. But we're going to dissect this verse over the next couple of weeks. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 through 15 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, then pray and seek my face, but turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, they will forgive their sin, they will heal their land. Now mine eyes are open, and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Now, if you are making a cake or uh, making cookies or any type of uh, meal whatsoever, you have ingredients for that meal. You have eggs, flour, uh, baking soda, uh, water, uh, milk, uh, different things. They utilize cornmeal in your different uh, dishes. Uh, maybe you have vegetables or uh, meats that you put in there. But if my point is every recipe, uh, every meal has a recipe that has ingredients. This is a, this scripture right here, Second Chronicles 7, 14 through 15, has the ingredients for having your life healed, having your family healed, having your country healed, having your community healed, having your home healed. Notice it says, if my people, it does not say if the world or lost sinners or idolaters or effeminate, but it says if my people. We, uh, the Bible tells us that First Peter four seventeen, for the time has come that judgment must first, that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel? Let them, I'm gonna read this again. I'm sorry. 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? What shall be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Boy, I'm skipping a word there. Uh, that's important to read every single word in God's Bible because it's put there for a purpose. Skip one word and it can change the whole meaning. He's telling us here that judgment's going to start at the house of God first. But it will because we we are almost, I'll be skipping ahead if I get to that. But judgment starts at the house of God and then uh, one day there's going to be another judgment where those that don't know God are going to be judged. But if it starts with his children first, imagine how it's going to be for those that don't know him. Now, you may say, what is judgment exactly? Judgment is the ability to make considered decisions or come to a conclusion. Discernment is shrewdness, common sense. Good sense, sense, perception, wisdom, prudence, understanding, 
intelligence or awareness. Uh, those are the, the good things of, of judgment. Those are the things that God's talking about here where he says that, that we need to humble ourselves and seek his face and pray. Pray and seek his face. Because we, first of all, need to judge our own hearts. Then we can only do that through God's word. But we judge our hearts and look at our life, then inspect it and see where things need to be changed. Judgment can also be a misfortune or calamity viewed as a divine punishment. The Bible says that God will punish his children. If we are, if he convicts us of sin in our lives and we refuse to turn from it, we refuse to live in obedience, he will bring punishment, the correction into our lives. So it's wise and it's prudent for each one of us that know him as our savior to take the uh, instruction, take the conviction when the Lord puts it in our heart and put it to use and transform ourselves through, through his guidance to be more like him. And uh, as a Christian for 25 years now and uh, living with Christians that have been saved even longer, double that time of my salvation, I can tell you that, that the Lord does bring correction and he will draw you closer to him uh, and through many different ways, but correction being one of those. But so it's easier to judge ourselves through God's word than to uh, be disobedient and allow the judgment of God to have to be brought into our lives. But we as Christians can judge ourselves through the lens of God's word um, or, or we can face the consequences here on earth and also in the judgment to come. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 7 through 11, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 through 11, the Bible says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, that we, that we may be accepted of him. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, every one may, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men now, that's talking about a judgment day that's going to happen for each one of us Christians. And we have preached on that in the past, and I believe the title of that message is just simply the judgment seat of Christ. I think we may have done a, a short series on that. You can go back in the archives and look there on our Facebook page. But uh, there is a judgment called the judgment seat of Christ that each one of us Christians will uh, experience and stand before God and give an account at. And you can read about that in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 14. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 14. But we're not going to get into that today exactly uh, uh, the breakdown of what's going to take place there but the Bible is clear that that we are going to be tried with fire as with fire and that whatever's left over uh, after that fire burns up will, uh, will determine our reward there in heaven that will determine our service and how we uh, uh, get to live through eternity and the Bible says that what's done for him will be like gold, silver, and precious stones 
than what we have done simply for ourselves and just out of rebellion will be like wood, wood, hay, and stubble. And that, as you know, burns up. 1 John 2, 8 tells us, But now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence, but not be ashamed before him at his coming. Friends, if you don't live your life according to God's word, if you just live your life for yourself, with what you think or what the world tells you, you may say, what do you mean what the world tells you? That TV is your teacher. That radio is your teacher. So is God's word. You have all kinds of different teachers. Facebook's your teacher. Because, they, because you're gathering information from all these other sources. And they're telling you how you should live. They're telling you, hey, everybody else is living like this. So that's the way you should live also. But God's word says things totally different. But the reason I bring that up is because I just saw a commercial the other day where it was talking about, I've learned this and, I, and this has taught me and this and this and this. But it showed all these different movies. And then it showed two men kissing. And, and it is exactly right. But it made me want to throw up. But, it, but it's right. It's a teacher. It teaches you. And I thank the Lord for YouTube where you can uh, select what you're going to watch. Then you can be very particular with it. Then if you uh, use it for God's glory, you can listen to a lot of good preaching, a lot of good stuff on prophecy. You can catch up on news that you're not going to see uh, anywhere else in, in the media. And uh, so it can be used for good things. But there's a lot of bad things out there on it also. And the Lord tells us here that we can be found ashamed when he calls us home. That means there's going to be a lot of Christians that have been living for themselves and living for the things of this world, living for this flesh, who are going to be ashamed when the Lord sounds a trumpet says, Come up hither. But the dead of Christ rise first, and then we which are alive and remain are caught up together in the air to meet the Lord in the clouds, to be with him forevermore. We're going to find ourselves at the judgment seat of Christ. And after that, at that judgment, we're going to be embarrassed. We're going to be ashamed. We're going to wish that we had lived a different life. And realizing that life was so short, and that we had such little time, and yet we squandered it on fleshly things. Then that's sad. That's very sad to think about. But but, but John here in John two twenty eight, First John two twenty eight, said warned us that uh, we need to live for God so that we can be confident and not be ashamed before him at his coming. He also uh, talks about in another place in scripture, which I don't have this reference, that you can lose your rewards. The rewards God desires to uh, give you for the service that he intends you to do, you can lose. You can lose those rewards by your disobedience. You can lose those rewards through uh, your rebellion, through your, your desire just to live for yourself. Now, all of us uh, that have open eyes and ears to hear could see this world's in trouble. Our world's in trouble, our country, our community, possibly even our families, even our own homes. But God has given us the recipe for killing our land and for us to have our prayers listened to and heard uh, when we lift them up to him. But a major part of that recipe that we find in 2 Chronicles 7, 14-15 is humbling ourselves. Now that's not something that most people want to do. 
because it doesn't come natural. It goes against the grain, goes against the flow. You could say pumbling is a process that we must do though. Pumbling, the definition for that would be having or showing a modest or low estimate of one's own importance. Another would be a lo of low social, administrative, or political rank. So, humbling ourselves would be taking ourselves and doing for others. It would be uh, realizing where we stand in comparison to God and what he expects from us. A lot of Christians are their own idols. Most humans in this world are their own idols. Um, in uh, 1 John 5, 21, the Bible tells us, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, an idol is something that you put above God. An idol is something that you... Uh, think about more than you think about God, that you would rather be around than, than God, that a lot of people are their own personal idols. Uh, statistics of selfies. Everybody knows what a selfie is, people taking their own little phone picture and, and plastering it up all over the place. But according to Google statistics, there are about 93 million selfies that were taken per day as far back as 2014. And that's just on Android devices alone. 93 million people taking pictures of themselves each and every day. One poll found that the, every third photo taken by those of age 18 to 24 is of their self. This world is about me, 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 me. Most people are about me, 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 and what do you think about me? Uh, I heard a preacher uh, saying just the other day that uh, it's a common story. You probably have already heard it about the, the guy uh, I heard somebody compare Bill Clinton to this one time. They said uh, he, he, he was talking about how wonderful he was and, and what a great person he was and uh, uh, what all his accomplishments were. And then finally he said, well, enough about me. Uh, what do you think about me? And uh, sadly, that's the way people are. That's the way most of us are. It's all about us. I heard a preacher this morning preaching about how a uh, large mall or a store had uh, run an experiment where they set up this huge mirror there in the front of their store for uh, right as people came in the store. And they just monitored how many people stopped and looked at themselves in the mirror that pretty much almost everybody stopped and looked at their selves. Some of them smiled, some of them straightened up their clothes or what have you. But uh, people are concerned about their looks. They're impressed with themselves. They want to impress others. They want other people to look at them. Everybody wants to be noticed. Everybody wants to have a place of importance. Well, as, as Christians, we need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and realize that we have a God that we are going to be held accountable for, but we don't need to conform ourselves to this world. We need to conform ourselves to God because pride is what got Satan thrown out of heaven. It will destroy our country it will destroy our communities. It will destroy our homes. But if we do not humble ourselves before God, 
that will destroy our own lives, then cause us to come up short than his mission for our life. We must humble ourselves. Part of humility is being a servant. God wants us to be a servant. Jesus was our example. He said he came not to serve, uh, to be served rather, but to serve. And that's what he did. He laid down his life for you and me and for whosoever will. But Philippians 2, 4 through 8, Philippians 2, 4 through 8, the Bible says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So humbling ourselves, learning to be a servant, is learning to be a servant. Don't just look on your own stuff. Look on others, especially husbands and wives. They should be looking on the things of each other. But family members should be looking on the things that the family members need. We as Christians should be looking at things that the elderly and the disabled and the people that can't help themselves need. That's our job as Christians to not look on our own things, but look on to the needs of others. Going on though with Philippians 2, 4 through 8, it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He said, now that's how God thought. When he was living with us here on earth, that's how he thought. He didn't go around thinking about himself. He went around helping others. Think about that. He, he Everywhere he went, he was going and he was telling, teaching people how to live. He was teaching people uh, what they needed to do to serve him, serve the Lord, how they could, how, how they could uh, reach out to others. He was teaching his disciples to feed the thousands with just a few fishes and loaves. He was uh, healing the blind, raising the dead, causing the lame to walk, the dumb to talk, the deaf to hear. He was uh, uh, giving sight to the blind. He was serving those around him, serving those that were less fortunate, serving those that were at the bottom of the totem pole. He, those were the people he was serving. Uh, Jane, in the book of James, that talks about uh, not reaching out to those that are rich and trying to serve them, putting them in a special place, but serving the lowly, serving the poor, serving those that have don't have the means that you have. Going on in Philippians 2, 4 through 8, look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, Jesus is God, when he was there in heaven, he, he, he is God, when he was down here on earth, he was God, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He was equal with God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. But he made himself of no reputation. He didn't come down here boasting about who he was. He didn't come down here uh, bragging and, and demanding that people bow down and worship him. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant that was made in the likeness of men. He's our example. We're supposed to be servants. But being found in fashion as a man, listen to this, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, he had a choice to make when he was here on earth. He was a man just like you and me, in human body, he felt pain, he felt rejection, he felt suffering, he felt hunger, he felt 
the other needs that all of us have. But he humbled himself. He didn't. He didn't uh, um, allow those needs and those desires to control him. He put those down. And he went to the cross just like he came and purposed to do. When he left heaven, he left on a mission. His mission was to come down and to save mankind from their sins. Now, when he got here on this earth, he was here in human flesh. He had a decision to make, and he was tempted. The devil tempted him, and uh, he was tempted. I'm sure on a regular basis by all kinds of different things but he made that conscious choice to serve the Lord to serve himself to do what he was supposed to do that he went to the cross and died for me and you now just as God had a plan for himself when he came down here on this earth he has a plan for you and me and it may not be a comfortable plan it may not be a smooth and easy plan that may not be exactly what you desired. Every life is different. Every every uh, person's life is, is not the not the same. I think everybody could agree with that. And uh, you know, if if I had my perfect will myself, I would not be in a wheelchair. But I am, and I can be satisfied with that. And I can serve the Lord in that. That whatever God's lot is for you in your life, you have to come to terms with it and live for Him with that. Then you make the decision on a daily basis of how you're going to do it. You can do it half-heartedly. You can do it whining and complaining and murmuring and being grouchy and ugly. Or you can do it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord as God's Word says. Now, we are all part of the body of Christ. There's not one of us that is more important than the other. You may say, well, I, I, I don't preach, and I don't teach Sunday school, and I don't sing in the choir, and I don't do that. I'm just somebody that goes to church. You're just as important as anybody else in the Amen. body of Christ. God has a purpose and a plan for you. Amen. You could be one of those prayer warriors that nobody even knows about that is accomplishing mighty things for God because you're lifting up those that are out there on the front line serving the Lord and you're praying for them and God is utilizing your prayers to strengthen those people to give them the abilities to do what they need to do because they get suffered discouragement. They may have needs, uh, financial needs. They may have uh, physical needs. They may have uh, uh, just whatever. But God uses your prayers to answer those needs. Uh, but, but we are all the body of Christ. None of us are more important than others. We all have a job to do and need to stick to it. You need to stick to it. God honors faithfulness. That's, uh, that's something that God looks very highly on, his faithfulness. He doesn't like quitters. He said, when you don't, don't put your hand to the plow and look back again. Uh, that, that, that's not good. Think about Lot's wife. She, she uh, was looking back, longing on the things of the world. When you put your heart on the things of God, let them stay there. Serve the God to your, with, with, with all your heart. We are in the last days. The devil will try to discourage each one of us and try to get us off track. He's going to try to get you off track. I've had friends this week even that the devil's tried to get off track. He's used supposed Christians to try to pull them down, to try to destroy them, try to turn them against their own, own families, then the devil, that's the way the devil works. He seeks to get control of your life. People bring people into your lives or circumstances. 
They could even use your own pride and self-worth to cause you to stumble and fall but not succeed than whatever the mission is God has for you. Now each one of you have to decide what that mission is God has for your life. Why did God make you? Why did God form you? Why did God call you? He's called the whole world. He's called whosoever will believe in him. But they should not perish but have everlasting life. But, you know, when uh, you were created, there was a huge competition for, uh, for life. A huge competition. Millions and millions and millions of, uh, of individual uh, seeds were seeking to get to fertilize that egg that was fertilized that became your life in your person with your DNA, with your build, with your structure, with your intelligence, with your abilities. And God allowed that to happen. The Bible says he lighted every man. And scientists have now proven that the moment the egg is, is fertilized, that there is a spark of, of light, which proves God's word right there. Where he lights every man. He has a purpose for your life. Amen. But he has a purpose for my life. I did not grow up as a child expecting to be in a wheelchair. I did not expect to have to have help with everything in my life. I did not expect to have that. Yes, I went through times of doubt and times of anger and times of uh, distress but I have learned to live for the glory of God and that's my intention to do so and it should be the intention of each one of us and we need to be on guard that our pride can get in the way of us living for the Lord that's why the Lord said if my people who are called, called by my name will humble themselves we need to humble ourselves. Then Romans 12, 3 through 4, the Bible says, Romans 12, 3 through 4, the Bible says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith for as we have many members in one body all members have not the same office so your office may be different than mine but my office may be different than yours but we're to think soberly because you realize that the battlefield is your mind and if you're not thinking soberly, if you are, if you are intoxicated with pride, if you are intoxicated with uh, anger, if you are intoxicated with self-will and rebellion, it will prevent you from fulfilling your duty Amen. as a member of the body of Christ. That's why we have to humble ourselves. Part of humility is saying, I'm putting my desires, my wants to the side that I'm going to serve the Lord. That's humbling yourselves in the sight of God. The only way we are going to be effective for Christ is to realize we are imperfect beings living in a wicked world full of enticements, the enticements that will drag you down and cause you to be ineffective and to fall short of your duties for your master and savior Jesus Christ we have to be willing to inspect our lives that's what humbling ourselves is about it's about inspecting our lives to see where the change changes need to be made whether it's our thought life or our physical actions 
Because if you ever get a grasp of the reality that you will stand before a thrice holy God, it will alter your life. It will to totally change you. If you go over to 1 Corinthians 3, 9-14, through 14, and you see that judgment, that God has prepared for each one of us Christians, which is called the judgment seat of Christ, then you realize that God has rewards waiting on you, but he also has judgments that are going to take away those rewards. It will alter the way you live. If you realize that, that you have a duty as a Christian to serve your Creator, your Savior, it will alter your life. There will be a re reality check to realize that we are actually nothing and anything about us that is good is because of God. Paul said, I am what I am because of Christ. There's nothing good in me. I, I, I know people in wheelchairs that do bad bad things we'll just say do bad things and uh, disobey laws and uh, take advantage of situations you can't say well Sam you, you serve the Lord just because you're in a wheelchair you have to serve the Lord uh, you, 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 know, you don't have a choice I do have a choice Yeah, amen. and everybody has a choice I have made the choice that I'm going to serve God I have found that that's where I am happiest. I am happiest serving God, doing what I'm supposed to do, which is preach and teach, but tell the tell, tell the world about the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a reality check to realize that we are actually nothing, but anything anything about us that is good, but it's because of God. Don't think that the, that what's good, what what good you do, is because of yourself. If you do anything good, it's because God has put that desire in your heart. But when you start inspecting your life, then you look through the lens of God's word, by how you should actually live, not the way the TV says, not the way Facebook says, or Pinterest, or uh, Twitter, or whatever it is out there whatever the platforms are uh, excuse me for not being up to date on those but you you can't listen to those things to get advice on how you should live how you should act how you should walk and talk and dress and go and and come and and, and do you can't do that you got to get your 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 code of conduct, your code of dress, your code of action from God's Word. That's the only way that you're going to be found pleasing in the eyes of God. But when you inspect your life, it will cause you to stop trying to impress people, but cause you to stop looking, acting, and being like the world. It will cause you desire to look and act like the Lord Jesus Christ. It will cause you to realize your life is not yours. Your life is God's. You don't belong. If you are Amen. a born again believer, you have been purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ. You are just like a slave upon a slave block, but it's bondage to sin. But the Lord said, I am paying for that person, and I am setting them free of that. Amen. But if he becomes your master, then you are his servant. But 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 19-20. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 tells us, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body 
and in your spirit, which are God's. That, that goes contrary to what this world says. This world says, uh, do what you want to do. Go, go do whatever. You're of this age or you're of that age. But you're right, just do whatever. That's not what God says. It doesn't matter how old you are. You don't have the right to just do whatever you want. You have the right to serve Jesus. Amen. You have the privilege to serve Jesus. But you have to be in his word to know how to serve him. Or you have to be listening to godly counsel. You have to be listening to godly preaching. To have that direction, to have that discernment, to know how to serve him. This country is just the opposite of, me, of being humble. We're talking about humbling ourselves, about thinking less of ourselves and more of others. Um, we're trying to finish up here. There's a great difference between the way things used to be and the way they are now. I was uh, watching a uh, documentary recently on the Great Depression. The Great Depression lasted between 1929 and 1933. Four-year time span. And uh, 1933. I don't know if I said that right. 29 to 33. And... Uh, uh, it went from being uh, pompous and uh, prideful and, and uh, people dancing and jumping around and uh, just absolutely full of themselves and this world uh, uh, country was just frolicking and playing and thought they had the world by the tail but then the rug was jerked out from under them. When this country was humbled, when the Great Depression took place, when hundreds of thousands of people died, you don't hear about that much. But look at the uh, look up the uh, I believe it's called the Great Holocaust of America. Look up that that that, that on uh, YouTube. It's terrible. Thousands and thousands of people starved to death in this country during the Great Depression. This country was humbled. It was full of pride, full of wickedness, full of sin. But God had to humble it. I want to show you a picture of a lady during the uh, Great Depression. Hopefully you'll be able to see it okay. I don't know if you can see that. Erica, look at my phone see if it's right. Let's see here. Might give it a second to pull up. But this lady is very, very sad. Very, uh, everything's been taken away. She has nothing. She, uh, you can see in her face, she's deep in thought. She, she has no idea what to do. She has been totally, totally humbled. But we as Christians, we need to come that, become that way in our lives. We need to get over ourselves and get to Christ. We need to draw nigh to Him so that we can be effective for Him. Now, uh, humility is a, the absolute opposite of pride. The only way we are going to have our land healed, but our families healed, and have our prayers heard and answered is that is if we as Christians, God's people, inspect our lives and humble ourselves before the Lord. Now, in the story of Jonah, most people know the story of Jonah and, uh, and the well. In the Old Testament, it says he was swallowed by a great fish. Jesus clarified it in the New Testament and said, it was a well that swallowed him, and even in modern times, 
there have been instances of people being swallowed by whales and still living. But it, it is a scientifically proven fact that that can take place. But it's a, uh, uh, a fact that that took place in history where Jonah was swallowed by a whale because he had ran from God and God's will for his life, God's command for his life. Then he had, uh, I was so full of animosity and pride and anger towards the Ninevites who had uh, um, committed atrocities against the Israelites. They were very wicked, wicked, ungodly people. But uh, he ended up bringing judgment to those that were around him when he fled on a ship away from the destination God told him to go and uh, got swallowed by that well then got thrown up on the shoreline of the place that he was supposed to be you see you try to run from God then he'll bring you in full circle right back to where you're supposed to be because he will accomplish what he has started in you He'll accomplish the work that he wants to, to, to accomplish through your life. But Jonah found himself in a position where he was thrown up on the shore of this country, the country that worshipped a God, the, a God that was half man, half fish. But here this great fish threw up Jonah on their shoreline and it just probably absolutely was a shock to them. But the scientists tell us also at this time that there was uh, right before this a uh, full solar eclipse that had passed right over Nineveh also. So they knew that God was trying to get their attention. America's just had that uh, recently in the past few years and there's another one coming up soon. And uh, America should see that God's trying to speak to it. This country's in grave danger, grave, grave danger of judgment. But listen to uh, what uh, the Ninevites did when they heard that their judgment, their country was about to suffer judgment. This is found in Jonah 3, 4 through 10, or Jonah 3, 4 through 10. When Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, then cried and said, Yet forty days and none of us shall be overthrown. Now that's the message that he spoke. That's that that's the full message. that's all he said. But he didn't say repent, he didn't say uh, anything else. But the fear of God fell on these people, and they they did repent. But he said, Yet forty days and none of us shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, but proclaimed a fast, but put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, that he arose from his throne, and, lay, and he laid his robe from him, but covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through through Nineveh by the decree but the king and his nobles saying let neither man nor beast nor let man nor beast herd nor flock taste anything let them not feed nor drink nor drink water but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand, their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent but turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Now listen to this. When God saw their works and they turned from their evil way, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. But God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do 
unto them, and he did it not. Now, judgment's come into this country, and judgment's come into this world. We are definitely in the last days, the last moments of the dispensation of grace. We are moving uh, closer and closer towards a tribulation period. Just prior to the tribulation period, the church of God, the, the, the body of Christ, those that have trusted in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, are going to be called out of here so the Lord can start dealing with Israel again on a national basis to get their attention to show them that they have missed their Messiah and they are going to uh, have to suffer many things and this world's going to suffer with them. And if we as Christians do not humble ourselves, but we do not seek God's face and pray, but turn from our wicked ways, as these Ninevites did, then we're going to lose family members, we're going to lose loved ones, we're going to lose brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, we're going to lose all kinds of people that we wanted to go to heaven with us. They're going to be left behind, but they're going to end up dying and going to hell. Now, do you really believe there is a hell? If you really believe there's a hell, you'll humble yourself. I will humble myself. My home will help humble ourselves. We'll seek God's face. We'll pray. We'll turn from our wicked ways. Then, then God will kill our land. Then he'll forgive our sin and kill our land. He, say, he says in that scripture there that now my eyes shall be open but my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Do you wonder why your prayers aren't answered? Do you wonder why things aren't, uh, aren't happening when you pray? Maybe it's because you need to humble yourself. Maybe it's because you need to pray more and seek God's face and turn from wicked ways, turn from the things of this world and cling to Jesus. That's the way, that's the recipe, that's the plan for having your land healed. That's the plan for having your prayers heard and answered. Have you ex accepted or responded to what God has been trying to show you? Has God been trying to work in your life? Because I know God's been trying to work in my life to transform me and make me more like him. I know he said that he'll do that for each one of his children and that we are to shine brighter and brighter through the coming day. And each day we're supposed to look more and more like him. Have you responded to what God has been trying to deal with you in your life? In Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, the Bible tells us, this is our last passage, Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So he says, when I've spoken to you, you need to listen to it, so you don't let it slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast in every transgression, then disobedience received a just recompense of reward how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken of, spoken by the Lord but was confirmed unto us by them that heard him God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders but diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now we've spoken about us Christians being judged. Did you know the angels have been judged? But they're going to be judged again? There was a time there in the book of Job where uh, the angels came before the Lord and they were judged. The iniquity was found in Satan. 
who was cast out of heaven. And uh, there's going to be another judgment. And the Bible says that we as Christian people are going to judge those angels. But he says here, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, but every transgression and uh, disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? My friends, if the angels couldn't escape judgment, we're not going to escape judgment. Your family's not going to escape judgment. Your friends, your associates, your co-workers. We need to be telling people about Jesus. Salvation is as easy as the ABCs. We simply admit we're a sinner. We believe Jesus came and died and rose again by the cross, uh, died on the cross, rose again from the grave by the third day. But we call upon him for salvation. We admit we are sinners. We believe on the Lord Jesus, but we ask him to save us. That's how we are saved. But that's the message we as Christians are to share with those around us. But if we're living in pride and if we're living for ourselves, if we're living in iniquity and sin, or just living for this flesh, we're going to be ineffective. We're not going to have our prayers heard. We're not going to see our families saved. And we're not going to be able to be found uh, 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 proud and, uh, not, I don't want to use the word proud, but we're not going to find ourselves on our judgment day pleased with the life that we live. As, uh, as the Lord said there in First uh, John 2, 28, that uh, we can be found ashamed before him at his coming. But he warned us not to, uh, to, to, to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord so that when he does appear, we can have confidence but not be ashamed before him at his coming. Friends, what does the Lord want you to humble about yourself? How does he want to humble you? Is your life all about you, you, you? How people see you? How people can look at you more? How, what, how you can be promoted? How you can have your way, your will? Are you willing to humble yourself but let God have his will? That's the only way you're going to be effective. We're going to move along through 2 Chronicles 7, 14 through 15 next week and get into that more. If you, I, I, I encourage you to read it. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 through 15 so that you can be more familiar with the recipe for having your family and your friends saved from the, this land healed. God bless you. I look forward to being back with you next week. This has been Sam Hendon with Mount Underwood Baptist Church. We love you and thank you for being Samuel online with us. And this is also with SamuelSaven.org. But thanks, Brother Eli, and each one of you out there that are uh, online. I can't see everybody, but God bless you. Please pray for us, and we will pray for you. And we look forward to being back next week with you. In the meantime, purpose in your heart to share Jesus with somebody this week. Have a great day.